morning and welcome to today's virtual media conference to apprise you of government's efforts to combat COVID-19. Today with me are the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram, and the Minister of National Security, the Honorable Stuart Young. The Minister of National Security, the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, will provide an update on COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Good morning. Good morning to my colleague, Minister Young, and to the Chief Medical Officer. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the media, and to the wider viewing and listening public. Uh, today is one of those days that I wish never existed because of developments worldwide and locally. I wish I did not help have to tell the country that the world has now seen its 10th millionth case. 10,294,019 cases. I, I wish I didn't have to say that. I also wish I did not have to say that over half a million people have now died. 505,459. As we move into the end of what might be the fifth month of this global pandemic, if you consider February to be the real start of the explosion of cases. I wish we didn't have to discuss these figures today. I also wish that as Minister of Health, I did not have to talk about the different industries that have not lived up to their word. But before I do that, I do want to congratulate those industries that were opened up that did live up to their word. The food industry, they have managed themselves well. Construction have managed themselves well. Uh, personal grooming, they waited their turn and they opened up with protocols. I continue to, to, to say the doubles vendors are my heroes. They waited for their turn to open up and they did well. Places of worship waited their turn to open up and they have conformed to all the protocols. So every single industry that waited its turn and that worked with the Ministry of Health by supplying us with their protocols have done well. Between Saturday and last night, both Minister Young, myself, and I dare say the Honorable Prime Minister, we have been monitoring what has been going on in uh, bars and so on. Let me just give you a brief summary of what some of the news is like around the world. In the UK, the city of Leicester could be placed under a local lockdown after infections surge. The United States of Florida, the US states of Florida and Texas have reinstated curbs on bars to battle a surge of infections. The head of the European Commission has warned that no country will escape the pandemic until it has ended everywhere. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and whilst we have done well so far, we cannot allow one industry to send us back to the dark ages. And let me explain why. We are currently in the midst through the Ministry of National Security and bringing back our nationals by the hundreds, by the hundreds. They are occupying our quarantine facilities. And if we have positive cases, they will occupy our medical facilities. If we continue to conduct ourselves in a way that breaches all the public health measures we have put in place, it means our hospital system becomes overwhelmed. We may have to stop allowing nationals to come back in because we will need those facilities to treat with communities spread by the hundreds and the thousands. At earlier press conferences, I indicated that as we move from treating cases 
especially from 115, 116, 117, and we moved to reopening of the economy, we did state that the battle has now been passed to the public. Minister Cox, you may remember those statements. We said clearly the battle has been passed to the public and to industry. And every industry, bar one, has responded magnificently. The Minister of National Security will speak to the specific measures that we have been discussing, uh, that we have advised the Prime Minister on, and the Minister and the Attorney General as it relates to bars. I just want to say that I am personally disappointed with this one part of the reopening, which has the potential to erase every single gain that we have made. We took a decision not to open up party boats, Minister Young. You may remember that. But what is happening now is probably worse than what we anticipated with party boats. So how could we justify it? So we have to uh, put in some measures and at this point in time, I just want to say to Trinidad and Tobago, we are all in this together. We want employment. We want business to start back. We don't want to curtail business activity. But as we discussed on Saturday, the reports coming from Maracas, from Barataria, from Chaguanas, from Rio Claro, and Tobago, those reports have not been good. People continue to operate in a manner inimical to the best interests of Trinidad and Tobago. And as Minister of Health, I have advised both the Minister of National Security and the Prime Minister of what I think on what we think as a collective can be done. So Minister Cox, I thank you for those few minutes and I hand back over to you. Thank you very much, Minister. The Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram, will provide us with a clinical update. Dr. Parasram. Thank you, Minister Cox. Honorable Ministers, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public, the clinical update for today, Monday, the 29th of June, 2020, is as follows. The total number of tests done within the public sector, the University and Caribbean Public Health Agencies, are 4,969. Total number of unique patients tests conducted 3,985. Total number of repeated tests thus far, 984. Total number of community tests, 1,804. So we now include the private sector. So total number of tests done as of the 26th of the 6th, which was last week, Friday, 1,154, all negative. So that brings us to a total of 5,139 tests submitted between public sector and private sector. When we deal with the number of positive patients, number of positive patients remain at 126. Total number of discharges stay at 109. Total number of deaths at eight. Within the hospital system, we have nine individuals, all of whom came from the, the cruise ship, Enchantment of the Sea, and they are currently housed at the Cora facility. Four of those individuals are scheduled to be discharged, I believe, later on today, pending their final clinical details of um, this morning. In terms of our parallel system, we continue to have a total of 661 persons quarantined throughout the system. Beginning at the UE Davy Penal Campus, we have 42 individuals. At the Chancellor Hotel, we have 19. At the Taka River facility, we have no one at this time. In the Napa facility, where we have healthcare workers, there are six individuals. Home of football, we are now only one individual at that facility. In the UE Canada Hall, we were able to successfully decant the repatriated Jamaican students, and we now have no persons at that facility. The UE Freedom Hall remain with 46, and we are awaiting the SWOT results later today. If they are all negative, they will be decanted as well. In the KPOC Hotel, again, we have 48 nationals. On the most developer rig, we are 94 individuals, and the Vision on a Mission, Claxton Bay, there are 18. Just permit me a couple more minutes to go into a little more detail. I just want to read from a media release which we sent out on the 28th of June 2020 as it relates to the nationals, 293 nationals remaining on the enchantment of the sea. 
So the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of National Security, and the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago recently participated in a virtual meeting with representatives of the management of the Enchantment of the Sea cruise ship to discuss the quarantine status of the Trinidad and Tobago nationals on board the vessel. The decision was made in light of the re three recent COVID-19 positive cases from this group, and out of an abundance of caution, on Tuesday, 30th June, our nationals on board will be allowed to disembark the ship and will be moved into a state quarantine facility on land. Just to note, the, the cruise ship has to leave Trinidad waters on that particular date, otherwise we would have had the option to retain them on the vessel. This is to facilitate the continued monitoring of these nationals. The nationals will be held in quarantine for a short period of time, where another round of PCR tests will be conducted during this week. Upon receipt and review of these results, a determination will be made as to when they can safely be reunited with their families. The MOH, Ministry of Health, empathizes with the plight of these persons at this time, but advises that steps are being taken to ensure the continued safety of these nationals, their families, and the population at large. Minister Cox, that's my clinical update for this morning. Thank you very much. The Minister of National Security, the Honorable Stuart Young, will deal with the public health regulations and our borders. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Good morning, Minister Dial Singh, CMO. It gives me no pleasure to have to attend today's press conference to deal with the first issue that I'm about to talk about, which Minister Dial Singh touched on and which the Honorable Prime Minister referred to very clearly over the weekend. That is the unfortunate behavior of persons gathering at bars and outside of bars. We had one of the first steps that we took with respect to bars to stop congregation. Remember this virus spreads by congregation and by contact. So what we're always trying to prevent is congregation and the risk of community spread. What we saw with the first weekend of bars being open, starting really from last week, Thursday, onto Friday night, Saturday night, and even up to yesterday, has greatly disturbed us. We've sought the advice of our medical public health experts, and we've received the advice. And as Minister Dialsing alluded to, the Prime Minister himself and myself have conferred, and I'm announcing here today that the regulations will be amended during the course of today. In fact, I've just approved it, and we're currently waiting for the Prime Minister's sign-off. Bars will now be allowed to be open from 8 a.m., but will have to close at 8 p.m. This is the first step. A warning was given over the weekend by both the Prime Minister and Minister Dial Singh. We have taken this step to give another opportunity, not so much only to the bar owners and operators, but more so the patrons and the persons going to the bars and congregating on the roads, pavements outside of the bars. So the first step is today we will roll back and bars will now be required to close at 8 p.m. on a daily basis. They will be allowed to open at 8 a.m. We are reminding persons that the congregation of people inside of these areas, these bars, is limited to 25, but also outside, more importantly, in the public spaces, persons are not allowed to gather in groups of more than 25. In my discussions, my daily briefing with the heads of security this morning, and in particular with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the Commissioner of Police and one of the Deputy Commissioners of Police, we had certain discussions, policy directions were given, and you can expect the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to do the necessary enforcement. In the first instance, they will ask bar owners, anyone who has more than 25 inside their establishment and they're not adhering to the Ministry of Health protocols for bars, they will be closed. Those persons who are outside, if they're congregating outside in groups of more than 25 and behaving in manners, that would give concern for public health and also public order. The police will warn persons if they don't adhere. The police are authorized to close the various bars and other watering holes. The police have this power in law. When the police believe that there's a public health hazard or they're moving to stop or prevent a breach of the law, and in this case, the breach of the law is the congregation of more than 25 persons or the public health measures that they believe there's a risk. The risk is there is still this virus, a deadly virus called COVID-19. The police have been instructed 
to enforce the law. So they will first of all give a warning and if necessary, they will close down the various establishments that are found to be the genesis, the core of this type of activity of congregating. What we're asking bar owners to consider using is a last call system. So now that you know you have to be shut at 8, by 7.30, take the last orders and understand, not in the typical Trinidad system of everybody rushing at minutes to eat, get your drinks. People, we don't want to do these things. The bars are providing employment for a very important part of our population. But as we've said as a government from day one, we will take the necessary measures and steps and decisions and be decisive in doing so to protect the rest of the population. Trinidad and Tobago is very fortunate due to the decisions that were taken from us way back as January of this year. And we have prevented thus far, knock on wood, community spread in our, in our country. But the behavior that we've observed taking place over the last 72 plus hours has given us great cause for concern and today the decision has been taken to roll back. So bars will now be closed until 8 p.m. And a further warning, if we don't see a reversal of the type of behavior that has happened over the last 72 plus hours, the government will not hesitate to do what is necessary based on the advice that we get from our medical experts. Inside of these institutions, these entities, falls under the control of the bar owners. So you will be held responsible. Outside, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, and on occasions with the assistance of the Defense Force, will not hesitate to disperse the crowds. And we're asking people to please be peaceful. Remember, this is for your own good. The behavior we saw of people congregating one on top of the other, talking loudly, the, the, the bodily fluids flying all over the place. We can't stand back and allow this to continue. So this is the first step of rollback that we're taking here today. We also warn restaurants who have bar licenses. Right now, we're allowing you to continue to serve until 10 p.m. But if we see a continuation of behavior or the behavior moves to these restaurants who have bars inside, we will also roll back on that category of persons. So the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has been asked to enforce the law, and they will do so. And of course, if there's no improvement, the necessary action will be taken. The poli police will employ their powers, their common law powers, as well as their statutory powers to prevent any breaches of the peace. They have the laws of loitering, persons who are gathered outside. As we've seen, there was a video circulating of what went on in Barataria on Friday night. The police have been instructed and asked to uphold the regulations. This is for the protection of the population. There's the public health regulations, there's the public health ordinance, the laws of loitering, the laws of the, laws of the police having a duty, a common law duty, to protect and to protect persons and to prevent the breaking of the law. I just remind Minister Dialsing touched on it a short while ago. In the current regulations, and it will not be changed today when we amend the regulations, Parties are prohibited. What we've specifically said is party boats and clubs are not permitted to be open for business. The Commissioner of Police asked me this morning, he said a certain establishment in the West at one Woodbrook place, which is a club, was open on Friday night. I reminded the police that according to the regulations, party boats and clubs are not permitted to be open. So again, remember with every breach of the regulations, you are susceptible a $50,000 fine, six months imprisonment. We've also gone on to say that public parties or public fets are not permitted. Of course, public parties, public fets in private places is captured by this legislation. So we're cautioning persons. We have made sure that is not a loophole. So that is how we're dealing with, in the first instance, the very troubling scenes that we saw over the last week and in particular over the weekend with the behavior of persons in their congregation outside of bars. The police service will enforce the law and they have the full support of the government who in fact are asking them to continue helping us to protect the population. The second issue I've come here today to discuss is with respect to our borders. As you all are hopefully more than aware right now and to all of those who are looking on at other areas of the world, they always message afterwards to say they were looking on at the conference these are the following guidelines. We are bringing back 
the students from Cuba or at least offering them the opportunity. They're being granted exemptions to come home or students who are in Cuba because there's a, a flight that is being put on by Caribbean Airlines to assist the Cuban government. So we're using that opportunity to make the offer to our Cuban students and other nationals who are in Cuba to come home. Remember the balancing factor here is what Minister Dial Singh just talked about. It is the number of rooms we have, the number of spaces we have for state quarantine and the limited state supervised quarantine that we're doing. So that limits our numbers that we can bring back at any point in time. We are also reaching out to the students who are in India to tell them that they're being granted exemptions to come home on two conditions or three conditions rather. One, they must indicate to us their flight pattern, how it is, their flight schedule, their uh, itinerary. Two, when it is they expect to get here. And three, that they must understand that they will be subject to quarantine. I think by now everyone who comes to Trinidad, all our nationals understand they're going to be subject to the strictest of quarantine measures, but the very professional quarantine measures under the, the Ministry of Health, the Chief Medical Officer with the support of national security. We are also looking at the numbers of other persons who are in the region who have been out there and stranded for the last few weeks and months. We, are, we have the, the dates that these people requested exemptions to come in. So we're going to do some exercises. I will be discussing with Caribbean Airlines how to carry out those exercises or other private charter planes to get back other persons in the Caribbean area as the next wave of persons we're bringing home. I am putting down a caution now. The Caribbean and some of our CARICOM sister countries are not going to be permitted as jumping points. Right now, we have persons. There's a particular group of people. You know, We granted them exemptions. They flew from the United States to another Caribbean island, and they're waiting there to then jump across. We are not permitting other Caribbean islands that have taken decisions to open up their borders to international travel to be used as jumping points as launching pads into Trinidad and Tobago. I think by now the population, the 1.4 of us, 1.4 million of us here in Trinidad, understand the benefit of the protection that the government has offered and succeeded so far in by protecting our borders and keeping our borders closed. So we're not going to be allowing persons who think they can just jump on flights, get there, and then come across the Trinidad through that route. We are also looking at our citizens, our nationals, who are out in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom as the next big groups, and we're working those numbers. I'm collaborating with the Ministry of Health to work out the numbers and to see if we there's any room for expansion. So what we will be doing is con contacting people. We have a sort of priority listing system, and we'll be offering those persons, telling them, look, we're prepared to grant exemption. There will be an offer for state supervised quarantine, because some of them are in a position where they can pay for hotel supervised quarantine and we're looking to expand that facility a little bit and then that allows us those of our nationals who we can take into the state quarantine who will not be required to pay for their quarantine it allows us to have a broader group we are asking we know how difficult it is for every single citizen all of us including the prime minister minister of communication minister of health myself and cabinet colleagues we are all affected we all have family family members who are outside of Trinidad and Tobago that we continue to be worried about. We understand how difficult it is for our citizens who went out and found themselves stranded with the closure of borders and then the global pandemic. All I can do is plead with you to continue to be patient. We are getting there. It is a very slow process based on the numbers that we can manage with the parallel healthcare system. This is a guiding factor. How many numbers can we manage with our parallel healthcare system? And that is the process that is currently undergoing. So we're looking to see if we can expand our quarantine facilities. Um, what we're doing is, you all would have heard about the, the cruise ship and what the decisions taken yesterday. The ch chief medical officer touched on it a short while ago. We're decanting those nationals. So they will be on Trinidad soil by tomorrow afternoon as we get them ready for another round of testing. This is not because we're looking at any group or we're victimizing any group. Quite the contrary. We were very concerned, so we took the decision a few weeks ago to allow the cruise ship workers to come in. But of course, difficulties have now presented themselves, and it would have been irresponsible of the government with what presented itself to us on Friday and Saturday with some positive cases for us not to take that last precautionary step 
and just do another round of testing with, <clears throat> excuse, with our nationals on the enchantment of the seas ship. They are going to be coming off the ship tomorrow. We will take them into facilities that we're currently preparing. We will do a testing that will be under the Ministry of Health and the Chief Medical Officer, hopefully by Thursday of this week. And once everything goes well and everyone is negative, or those who are negative, the CMO will then take a professional decision. Bear with us for these few more days. Could you all imagine the disaster that it would have been if persons came off, went into the community, and then presented positive? We cannot pull it back once there's community spread, and we would be in difficult positions, like we're seeing some of the most sophisticated countries in the world. Your government has been and will continue to take the necessary scientific and medical public health advice from our experts that will guide us. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Thank you very much, Minister of National Security. Members of the media, the floor is now open. Remember to identify yourself and the media house you represent before posing your question. We want to give as many of you an opportunity to pose questions to us, <coughs> but that means in our limited time, we will have to give each media house a chance to get a maximum of two questions in. Once we have completed the pool and time allows, I will come back to you. So let us keep this in mind as we begin taking your questions. Newsday. Hi, good morning. Shane Super from the Newsday newspaper here. I have two really quick questions. The first one, I don't know if the National Security Minister or the Health Minister were here to weigh in. It has to do with the uh, same issue with respect to the bars. I know on Sunday, the TNT Beverage Alcohol Alliance would have hosted a meeting with some similar stakeholders where they discussed and announced some measures they would put in place to uh, regulate gatherings at bars and so on. And one of the measures would be to hold alcohol supplies from some of their bars. I just wanted to know from your perspective, do you think this is enough? Do you think it's sufficient to uh, really treat with the issue? Or do you think a more forceful approach from the um, stakeholders are needed to tackle this issue? And the second question can be answered by Minister Young, and uh, it's with respect to the reopening of the borders. When the borders eventually reopen, whenever that is, can, do you know if the government has a specific process to receive visitors from countries? And if so, can you just give us an outlook or an outline of that process, if possible? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Superville. With respect to the first question that you asked, and in particular the bars, we listened very carefully to what was said by the stakeholders. We think it is a step in the right direction. We think it was a very um, mature and responsible action. But at the end of the day, our clear message here today is that the bar owners, the bar operators, and the patrons of the bar are ultimately those who are going to be responsible for how we go forward with this initiative. So listening to the beverage persons and them saying that they will withhold the supply of beverages, all that does in our opinion is it puts the, a little additional pressure on the bar operators to understand if there's continued to be a breach and that is what the government is saying today with our rollback and closing of bars at 8 p.m. that we are prepared to take the necessary decisions with respect to the bars. Ultimately, it is up to the patrons and the operators of the bars from our perspective, and certainly from the national security perspective, the advice is very, very clear. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is going to enforce the law. We are not going to prevent a few persons who decide to flout the regulations to spoil it for the rest of us and put us at risk. So if the bar owners and operators don't take the, the measures that they need to to try and have a more responsible environment, and in particular, as, as I'm clear in saying here this morning, you can't simply say, well, the persons are outside on the pavement and you have no control. If they are coming into the bars to get their beverages and then going out, which is what we're seeing, we see you, the bar owner and operator, as being the source. We see that if we close the bar, then it will prevent those congregations of people outside who are going to be in breach of the regulations once there's more than 25 of them. So let's see how it goes, but our position is very clear. We are prepared to do what we have to to protect the population, but we don't want to affect all of those workers in the bars, all of those workers who just want to enjoy a quiet drink, whatever it is, but in particular to preserve the jobs of the bar owners. So do the best that you can. With respect to the borders, that is a very um, fluid position. And at this stage, I can tell you, 
we are not looking at the opening of the borders right now. We're managing bringing back our nationals. Because if you observe, as we do, what is going on in some of the areas in the rest of the world, and in particular very close to us in South America, and even in North America, is particularly frightening for us. And you all would be aware that the vast majority or a majority of our travelers would be coming from the United States when you open up that international travel. And that is one of the things that worries us. In Europe, you're seeing the mm -hmm. same thing in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom and the United States are two of the largest um, suppliers of the COVID numbers, positive COVID numbers on a daily basis. So we are doing everything and we will continue to do everything to protect the population. Right now, we're just focused on getting our nationals home not looking at the international travel. When we reach there, by then we would have all of the necessary protocols in place. But that is a massive risk that persons are taking, in our humble opinion. <coughs> Thank you. 98.1. Good morning to the panel. Stephen Cummings, 98.1 FM. My uh, two morning. questions quickly, one for... Uh, Minister Dial Singh and the other for uh, Minister Stewart, uh, Minister of National Security. Okay, um, hold on, hold on. Um, you're a bit low. Um, we'd like to get some more volume. Not hearing you clearly. Could you repeat the questions, please? Hello? You're right. Yes. yes. Good. Are uh, you hearing us? Yes, loud and clear now. All right, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I know we have been having some audio problems uh, a little earlier on. All right, my two questions uh, quickly, um, one for Minister Dial Singh and the other for uh, Minister Young. Uh, Minister Dial Singh, um, we, uh, you know, I take the point of us, uh, you know, being a small population and perhaps uh, not having the critical mass uh, to, uh, of cases, you know, uh, but uh, COVID cases. But uh, do you believe we should, in fact, be involved in an aggressive clinical COVID vaccine trial program? Uh, it's currently being done in many other countries, uh, that race for uh, a COVID vaccine, vaccine, almost like a competition, uh, one might say. Uh, and uh, Minister uh, Young, um, we talk about, um, you know, keeping the borders closed and, and um, you know, monitoring what's been happening. But we have been seeing the continuous uh, uh, inflow of, uh, albeit you know, in small numbers, of Venezuelan nationals. I think just uh, um, some hours uh, yeah, over the weekend, we've had about 11 uh, to 12 <coughs> Venezuelan nationals who came through um, by whatever means. Um, that uh, obviously continues to pose a threat to us as well. And I'm wondering what else can the ministry do uh, to avoid um, those kinds of uh, loopholes. And I know we've been talking about um, our borders being porous. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. May self help you go first. Thank please. you. So both the CMO and I will chime in on the COVID um, clinical trial program for vaccines. So I'll let the CMO go first, and then I will come in. CMO? Okay. So as it relates to vaccine trials in general, you, you tend to see that we do it in larger populations in the first instance. And Professor Carrington would have been on the program a few weeks ago discussing all the vaccines. I believe she said over 100 vaccines in trial at one point or the, or the other. And there are about three front runners as we go. Um, the problem with small island developing states is having the infrastructure one to deal with adverse reactions and to pick up adverse reactions as they occur and deal with it in a, in a manner that is befitting the vaccine trial. So it is very difficult for a small island developing state, to be honest, to, to be part of such trials unless we have gone away into phase four of those trials where there's some degree of certainty that the adverse reactions will be to a minimal level. So even if we are to go, it normally comes before the Ethics Committee of the Ministry of Health as a proposal for whoever is running that trial in particular. But, but the main issue is, you know, for smaller countries to participate, one, we have a smaller group of people that are willing, and of course, managing the adverse reactions are generally problematic. Chime in here from a policy perspective now. So you have gotten the clinical reasons why a small country um, should not participate in trials. From a policy perspective, I have to consider what happens if these trials or if these experimental vaccines produce fatalities. As happened in France about 10 years ago, the CMO might remember, there was a trial of a drug and it led to about five or six deaths. 
we have never done vaccine, tri vaccine trials in Trinidad and Tobago because one, our population is simply too small and the risk is too great to manage adverse events. Okay? So, Mr. Cummins, I hope that answers your questions. Minister Young. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. The, once you're on island, you're always going to have a difficulty with your maritime borders. So I, I have to frequently smile when I pe hear people say, but I thought the borders are closed. I wish it were as simple as just pulling a fence around the island. It would certainly make life a lot easier. You all would recall, even before COVID, there was always this potential. In fact, I was reading in the BBC recently, in England as well, once they have good weather, you have people coming across in makeshift rafts from mainland Europe. But you're right. The good news is you are seeing the benefits of the increased border patrols, the increased border protection, and we are picking up and we're intercepting persons coming across. In my discussions recently with our Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, I have asked them to implement the following additional measures. We are finding persons transporting illegal migrants on land. So a maxi driver or persons in panel vans or even in cars when they're being pulled over and the immigrants inside are illegal and have no authorization to be here. Because remember, everyone coming from Venezuela, even before COVID, required a visa. I have asked the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to seek the necessary legal advice and to charge these persons or citizens who are being very irresponsible with human trafficking. So those persons who are harboring illegal immigrants, those persons who are transporting illegal immigrants on land in Trinidad and Tobago, we are looking at charging them criminally with human trafficking, aiding and abetting in human trafficking, and these types of things. Trinidadian citizens have to be responsible and know that if they are doing these things, there are consequences. We are using, to the fullest extent, our, our interceptors, our ships, our larger ships, as well as our coastal patrol, our coastal radar system, and the air guard, and they're being quite successful in intercepting people. Up to this morning, I was asking, the Venez asking that the Venezuelan authorities are going to be making a repatriation this week with some who have been intercepted. We will continue to do all that we can in national security, but the additional measure now is I've asked for a more aggressive pursuit by law enforcement of the Trinidad and Tobago citizens who are part of this scourge of human trafficking and encouraging this irresponsible behavior. Those who are found going and coming across the borders, they are going to be charged with breach of the regulations. But I've also asked that we look in particular at human trafficking and any other criminal offense that can be brought to bear on these persons to send the signal that there are consequences to this illegal behavior. Mr. Cummins, let me just finish off the answer on drug trials. I spoke to the one in France. I called it up here. It was 2016, where six people were hospitalized and one died. And let me just give you the words. They called it <coughs> an astonishing and unprecedented reaction in the brain. <laughs> we cannot take those chances in Trinidad. We don't have a culture of doing these things. We don't have the resuscitation uh, capacities if something should go wrong. So I hope that further answers your question, sir. EZP News. Hi. Hi, good morning, Prior Bihari, EZPnews.com. Minister of Health, um, a, a short while ago, you said that in, in the quarantine system, we have 406 beds, and we are going to use 75% um, of that, which is 304. The CMO said that we now have 661 people in quarantine in Trinidad Tobago. Can you just give us an idea about those figures and those beds, and, and is it that if if we are um, yeah if we need more more bed spaces sure. in terms of that? And secondly, to the CMO, I've been asking about these gray areas, and um, we ACP has got more requests in terms of of sporting academies, for example, people who do these sports like 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 hockey, cricket, football, and in community centers, you know, they, they want to observe the, the proper pr um, protocols, but they are saying that they, they just want to get some more guidance in terms of whether they can have these sort of academy um, going on during this time when school is out. Thank you. Th thank you, Prior. So what the Chief Medical Officer and myself um, discussed this morning, and we have agreed upon uh, moving forward, 
is that we'll be using the Kuva Hospital as a quarantine facility. We could probably put about 200 there. Then we have capacity at Belandra. We have capacity at San Grande. So we have worked out the figures, and we have capacity. And it speaks to the policy we have been engaging in so far, in not opening the borders and bringing back thousands of persons. If we had done that, we would not have been, been in this position of luxury, where we are faced with having to quarantine roughly 295 persons on land. So it, it speaks to what we have been doing in a very measured way. And now we do, in fact, have the capacity at the flick of a switch to quarantine over 295 persons on land. So I hope that answers your question. CMO? Yeah, so um, just to conclude what Minister started, when I did the report this morning, we would have indicated that on the most developer rig, there were 94 individuals. And on the enchantment of the sea, there were 292. So that's roughly 400 out of the 661 that are quarantined on larger vessels outside of the normal quarantine sector. In terms of the gray areas, what I suggest is that they write to the Office of the Chief Medical Officer for clearance, which, which a number of agencies have done this thus far in terms of giving guidance. So you can either submit your protocols directly to my office. Um, you can use the email cmo at health.gov.tt. Um, email me directly and we can have a look at your protocols if you have one or suggest which guidelines you can adapt if need be. Okay, thank you. Before we move on, Minister of National Security, um, some persons online want to know um, if it is necessary to open bars from 8 a.m., why couldn't it be later? <laughs> and um, uh, just clarify 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Th th thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Minister Cox. That was actually one of the, the difficult decisions. My personal view, which has absolutely no place in this, is no, <laughs> it's not necessary to open a bar at 8 a.m. in the morning. I had a colleague who was telling me, 5 a.m. in the morning. I said, I, I, absolutely not. That is not something I can encourage. We have allowed the, the opportunity for bars to open at 8 a.m. because we wanted to allow people to get back out to work and, and just to have that opportunity. We understood the, the psychological effects, the wellness effects, and this type of thing. I am hoping that people are not frequenting, the vast majority of people frequenting the bars at those hours. But the decision was just taken to go at 8 a.m. because normally businesses are allowed to open at 8 a.m. There's some, some bars that also serve food. So the feeling was okay. F so from a breakfast time mm -hmm. where, where you have restaurants and bars and, and, and they're more focused on the food side, et cetera. So it's one of those decisions that you, you, you take and, and basically that was what is in the play. What I want to emphasize is what we're focusing on today and going forward is the closure of the bars by 8 p.m., that last call system. And we're pleased we will be continuing to monitor this very, very close, closely. And I hope we don't have to pull it back further but we will if we have to. Just one more note on the closing time, Minister Young, because we discussed this. We'll be asking the police, even though bar doors are closed, we know, we know that some bars are closing their doors and are still encouraging patrons to be inside. We know that is going on. So we'll also be asking the police once you start to see cars. Imagine seeing 15 cars outside a closed bar. <laughs> you know something is going on there. So we are just appealing to people. We do not want to shut down bars. We want the employment to go on. We want the act economic activity to go on. We want all that to go on. But this one industry out of all the industries are simply not adhering to the guidelines and playing their part in the national response. Minister Cox, if I may just add to that, huh? What Minister Dial Singh has just described is very clear in law. If you are found in a bar after 8 p.m. from tonight, you will be charged by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. They have the ability to charge you under the criminal law in, in pursuance of this legislation, the regulations. So the bar owners, bar operators, as well as anybody who's inside will be charged. And it's not only seeing your cars outside. If we are smarter than that, we've been monitoring it. We know that there are also people who are allowing people to park some way off and taxiing them in. We will do what needs to be done, and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service will enforce the law. Thank you. Thank you. 91.9.
Hi, good morning to the panel. Good morning, ministers. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Parashram, if I may, uh, just based on what Minister Young just said about our challenges with controlling the borders, which means that we are susceptible to people coming from South America, where we've seen so much of growth in cases. Uh, what, what does this mean in terms of our testing in particular? Because we're just uh, under 1% of the population testing. Is our testing at a satisfactory kind of level and looking at that border situation, if you could speak to that. And the, the second question I have is for Minister Young, in terms of immigration and people accessing immigration services to re-get their cards and regularize their status, because some uh, employers have been looking to our Venezuelan immigrants to, for them to get the necessary paperwork in order for them to restart working. You know, how is that particular facility being dealt with? At this time, thank Mr. you. Mr. Young, would you go first, please? Okay, Th thank you very much. As we've indicated previously, the cards were running for a year. That has not as yet expired. The Prime Minister himself dealt with this a couple weeks ago, and the Cabinet is going to be taken a, taking a decision to extend this period of registration until the 31st of December. So those who are current card holders, they're good until at least the 31st of December of this year cabinet is going to give it further consideration and the cards would not have started to expire as yet. Thank you. Dr. Parasram? Right, so in terms of, I don't know if there's necessarily a, a great link between the, the migrant population and testing capacity um, because the Ministry of National Security has been doing very well in terms of over the last few months managing the borders and we have actually seen a decrease I suppose in the number of people coming forward. Our testing has always followed the, the guideline that we would have tested once you develop symptoms. There's an alert, of course, in the county of St. Patrick in particular for the CMOH office to look out for individuals presenting possibly migrants. There's a national policy in place that we test and treat all persons, non-nationals included, for public health diseases or threats, so that is in place. We, we have the capacity to test more, so we have quite a, quite a large number of tests available to us, but the benchmark we use is, of course, the number of viral illnesses that we're seeing coming into our facilities. We can't usually reach out outside of our health facilities to go per to persons' homes and do testing. So what we are advising, again, is, is for persons who have symptoms to come in. Later on in the week, I will identify a few health centers, one health center per county, that person can actually go in and actively have tests done. Um, I'm just putting together that list uh, over the next couple of days, and that will be announced later on in the week as well. So I think the testing capacity so far is in keeping with the amount of viral illness that is presenting. And even up to this morning, discussing it with the CMOHs, they are saying that the numbers are extremely low of people actually coming into the facilities. So the numbers remain low. So the testing is proportionately low as compared to the number of viral illnesses coming to us. Let me, let me just decorate what the CMO has said because it's important what Vern has raised. The CMO actually brought the graphs at this um, press conference about two weeks ago to show the precipitous decline in all acute viral illnesses. I myself have been checking with GPs throughout the country and GPs are reporting that, abs but not absolutely, basically no one is coming to their offices with acute viral illnesses. So therefore, no one is symptomatic. Therefore, the testing is not a reflection. Well, the testing is a reflection, sorry, of acute viral illness, which includes the symptoms of COVID. Um, so because of the public health measures, hand sanitization, all these things are working and are keeping down and suppressing all acute viral illnesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Guardian Media Limited. Hi, good morning, everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. You all hearing me? Good morning. Yes. Yes, we're hearing you. Okay, great. So I have two questions. First, to either the Minister of Health or the Chief Medical Officer. Um, would you be able to say which facility those who are quarantined on the enchantment of the seas are being transferred to? because we have um, heard some concerns of these passengers saying that they would like to quarantine at home if possible because they are concerned about sharing commun communal spaces. And I guess the 
whole Balandra situation is resting on their minds where we had a large number of persons testing positive for the virus. They are saying that they feel they are in a better position because it's an amalgamation of the different crew members and they were all very isolated from one another and those who would have tested positive, they believe would have had the virus from before and they would not have had the opportunity to, um, call, um, to get it from these persons due to the isolated uh, circumstances they were in. Okay, so I will, I will start off with the policy prescription and then the CMO will come in with the clinical justification. We ascribe and have been ascribing since day one that all quarantine be under state quarantine in state control facilities or in facilities where it is under the direction of the public health system. It is because of that, Richard, it is because of that we have not had community spread. It is because of that people are safe. It is because of that our death toll is only eight. It is not the intention of the government at this point in time to go in contravention to the policies that have worked. We understand we empathize and we sympathize with those persons on that ship. We do. <laughs> this is not the government trying to... I saw in one newspaper it is being called political. This is not political. This is medical. This is medical, not political. We empathize with these people. But for the safety of their own families, what happens if one of those persons turn positive in a family setting and infect their entire family? Unknowingly, then the family goes out into the community, the supermarket, and all these things. And then you have commun wild community spread or they go into a bar. Rashad, as a government, we have to make very, very difficult decisions. And I... I congratulate you for advocating the views of the persons on the cruise ship, but we have a wider responsibility to the nation to protect not only those cruise ship persons, but 1.4 million people, Rashad. And I urge the media, continue advocating, continue getting their views. Um, but we are going to stand by our policy that all quarantine has to be state-run quarantine. I think CMO has a part of that question. Yeah. Well, I think Minister answered the question. It's, it's just really <laughs> to add, um, in terms of the testing, we really want to have, as I noted, the vessel has to leave Trinidad waters. If they were able to stay with us a few more days, we would have done the last round of testing on board. However, unfortunately, they have to leave the waters. So we will bring those persons on board to a state facility for the reasons Minister outlined. We can't send... 300 individuals to 300 households around the country, different places, and hope that none of them become positive. We have to have them in places that are within our control. If any of them become positive, of course, then there won't be a risk to the community in general in Trinidad and Tobago, and we'll be able to manage it much better. So we're just asking them to bear with us for a few more days. We will bring you on land. We will test you within a couple of days later on in the week. As soon as we get the results and they're all negative again, they will be able to return to their families safely. Thank you. I think Rashad has another question. Sure. Go ahead, please. Yes, I do. Um, I just want to correct or just make a clarification on one thing you said there, Minister, um, when you made reference to the media. By us bringing to light concerns of citizens, it does not necessitate that we are advocating for them. right? But my second question is to Minister Cox. Now that we have seen the number of persons uh, being allowed to gather is 25. C can you say when or if we would move away from this virtual press conference and back to the way we were having press conferences before? Well, I still have to get advice from the Ministry of Health, so I go over to the Minister of Health. And we will give you that advice in due course. We are still trying. We are still trying, Rashad. We are in the middle of a global pandemic. The less congregation we could have in tight spaces, the better. Please understand, 
we have reached 10 million cases of COVID. 500,000 people have died. The fact that Trinidad and Tobago has done so well, as I said last week, we have moved now from managing a medical situation to managing high expectations. Everybody's expectations now are so high that they want everything relaxed. Uh, the more things we can manage at this point in time, I think the better, but your, your question is taken and I will talk to the CMO about it. I can't make a policy decision on the fly. I'd just like to add, uh, Minister Cox, just to remind the population on this point, the virtual meeting system and this virtual interaction has a lot of positives. In fact, our cabinet is still meeting on a virtually, weekly basis, yes. virtually, finance and general purposes committee that I chair that we have this afternoon. We continue to meet virtually on a daily basis. I meet with the heads of security and some of their officers virtually. It is a lot safer and something that we want to encourage. Just because we're not lining up the coffins in Trinidad and Tobago doesn't mean we should just discard some of these measures that have some serious, serious health benefits to be gained. And also joint select committees of parliament, as even though they have less than 25 members, Richard, are still meeting virtually. So we really have to be careful how we open up things. The less things we can have people congregating, the better. Thank you. We are almost out of time, so I'm asking that questions and answers be to the point, please, at this time. Express. Hi, good morning. Morning. Um, morning. Uh, just Alexander Bruzel from Trinidad Express, sorry. Uh, I was just trying to, fair enough, two quick questions. While bars are a place of congregation, so are beaches. And um, while it was touched on briefly earlier, uh, this weekend in particular, uh, we saw most of our beaches being congregated. Um, in fact, along the North Coast, lifeguards ended their shifts early uh, because of this. And they were saying that they didn't have enough PPP or sanitizing agents. So part of my question is, what is being done looking at these areas of congregation, beaches and rivers? And um, uh, is there any a way of concerns of these lifeguards regarding PPE and preparation kits, basically? Additionally, uh, while not illegal, um, the government, especially at the beginning on March and April, it had stated that price gouging will not be tolerated. Uh, so I was curious if there are any reports, uh, information of price gouging. I'm asking this in light of, um, there was a bill which went viral on social media on, on from a particular restaurant, which gave a 2.5% surcharge for PPE and health protocol costs. Um, so yeah, it was already three. Okay, Mr. Cox, I can deal with the, the second question okay. first. Okay. And thank you very much for that opportunity. This bill has been brought to my attention last night and then this morning as well. And I've been asked to take a look into it with this charge that's being supplanted on the bill for PPE equipment. So that is something we're going and, to be looking and, at. Uh, COVID-19 protocols. Yes, and, like and COVID-19 mm -hmm. protocols. Yes. With respect to the, the, I can answer the lifeguard side and then pass yeah. over to either Minister Dialsing or the CMO with the health aspects of mm -hmm. the beaches and rivers. The lifeguards, we had a meeting last week between the permanent secretaries, the lifeguards and their union representative. The permanent secretary has told the lifeguards that any PPE gear that they need please let us know at National Security and we will provide it. We are not going to be lax on that at all. So whatever PPE gear that is needed, including the sanitizers, etc., will be provided to the lifeguards because we do recognize the vital role that they play and I thank them for it. Okay, so let me, let me t uh, tackle the issue of beach versus bar. Everything, as we reopen the economy, has to be what we call situation specific. In a bar, in an enclosed bar, you have people congregating close together, speaking loudly, over music, in close proximity to each other. That is a dangerous setting. A beach where you have strong natural breezes, wide spaces, the risks tend to be much different. That is why at the start, we had advised maxi taxis to have natural ventilation 
So think about a beach as being once you are sensible, once you don't congregate on top of one another, as we saw in beaches in United States and England, once you just apply basic common sense on a beach, you are going to be relatively OK. What is happening with the beaches, the one in Maracas especially, was that the bar became a flashpoint for a party atmosphere. Uh, people on top of cars, in your face, that is what makes it dangerous. But if you are on a beach with natural ventilation and, and you are relatively far apart a couple feet, that is fine as opposed to be a couple feet close in a bar setting. So it's situation specific. We just ask the population to use their good common sense. Listen to all the advice that we give you. And I don't know if the chief medical officer wants to come in there now. No, I, th I think um, basically it's just applying the public health guidelines as we prescribed and trying our best to have personal responsibility and keeping our families and ourselves safe. Thank you. Tobago Channel 5. Hi, good morning. Um, my question is in regards to a release that was um, recently put out this morning by Caribbean Airlines. Um, I would just like to know um, there are some announcements of flights from July 7, July 6, um, once a week out of the U.S. and Jamaica and so on. And I was wondering, is it that um, for when these flights are, are open, um, is it that the, 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 the national that are uh, going to be um, allowed on, um, would they still have to apply for permission through the Minister of National Security to be allowed um, to come back into the country? Thank, thank you very much for that question. I was hoping someone raised it. That is completely within the purview of Jamaica. You all would have seen that the government of Jamaica has taken quite a few very different decisions to Trinidad and Tobago. So they have decided that they're allowing international travel. Caribbean Airlines, after discussion with myself and the Prime Minister a few weeks ago, we allowed Caribbean Airlines to take dedicated aircraft up to Jamaica for them to service the Jamaican government. Those aircraft are u being used out of Jamaica to service Jamaica alone. So to answer your question, any national who wants to come to Trinidad and Tobago will continue to need to apply for an exemption to the Ministry of National Security. The Minister of National Security is the one who will grant that exemption for the people to come in. And I want to re-emphasize the point I made a little earlier. We are not going to allow other CARICOM islands to become jumping points and springboards into Trinidad and Tobago. So what is going on in Jamaica and them having international flights, that's for Jamaica alone. Nationals can fly to Jamaica by all means, but understand you're not going to be allowed to use that as a springboard into Trinidad and Tobago. And once our borders are closed, you'll continue to have to apply for an exemption. And we are managing that process along with the Ministry of Health with the numbers that you heard Minister Dial Singh and the CMO talk about this morning. Okay, I wish to apologize for those of you who are unable to ask your questions because we are out of time. We've come to the end of today's virtual media conference. Do remember that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Communications are your only credible sources of government information on COVID-19. For those of you who have not been able to renew your identification cards because of the pandemic, you will be happy to know that the Elections and Boundaries Commission has extended the validity of national identification cards. The EBC is advising that all ID cards issued by the Commission that have already expired as well as those due to expire in 2020, shall be valid until December 31st, 2020. Please note that no action is required to be taken by holders of such cards to extend their validity. A notice issued by the EBC stated that this extension of the expiry date of identification cards is instituted in accordance with registration rules 31, 5, and 6 of the Representation of the People's Act Chapter 201. And as we go, please be reminded that we must be disciplined and follow the public health guidelines to ensure none is rolled back. 
Now is not the time to become careless and return to the way we did things before COVID-19. We have done very well up until now, but remember, the reason for our success is our well thought out public health strategy. For those who frequent bars, I am appealing to you to desist from the irresponsible behavior we have seen. It is easy to get complacent, but COVID-19 remains a real threat, and to date, there is no cure for the virus. Let us keep Trinidad and Tobago healthy and safe. Please continue to keep your distance from each other. Wash your hands, cover your coughs, and avoid touching your faces. I also wish to remind you to wear a mask at all times. No mask, no service. I am Donna Cox, Minister of Communications. Thank you for joining us today as the government continues its efforts to keep the curve flat and beat COVID-19. Stay safe. May God bless Trinidad and Tobago.